Emily, you got some great footage. It was easy. They were really going at each other. Hey, look at this guy's face. They don't know it yet, but these students are about to uncover just what's so taxing about taxes. This isn't really going anywhere. We just have a bunch of pictures of people yelling at each other. They seem a bit confused. I think I could offer them some help. Do you guys want to do it? I mean, I don't see why not. Message or video chat? Uh, let's do video chat. Hey guys, my name's Keith. What's up? Yeah, well, we came across this demonstration and the speeches and signs got us thinking. We want to turn our footage into an extra credit project for class, but how do we sort out who's right? Well, why don't you take your camera and do some one-on-one -on -one interviews and see what people say when they're not all riled up? That might be a good place to start. Hey, let's go. Hi, who do you think pays the most in taxes? Um, the people. The wealthiest people. Oh god, I wouldn't know. It's supposed to be rich people, but it usually isn't. Um, middle class. I think so. Poor people. 50 and older. The government. Oh, I don't know. No idea. Huh? How do you figure out who actually pays the most? Let's go to the source. Take a look at this. It's the tax code for the United States government. In 1913, when the income tax was established, the Tax Act was only 27 pages long. Over the decades, the tax code has grown almost 200 times as long, to 5,000 pages. Back in the day, only millionaires needed an accountant to do their taxes. Today, the tax code is so complicated, people who make $50,000 or even less often need to hire accountants too. And as it's grown in complexity, interpreting it has become a specialty. The tax code, along with its legislative history, treasury regulations, editorial commentary, and collected court cases on each topic, have been rolled into the Commerce Clearinghouse Standard Federal Tax Reporter, or in tax lingo, the CCH. But by 2015, the CCH had grown to a whopping 74,608 pages. And it's predicted that at its current rate of growth, it'll reach 100,000 pages by 2050 when you'll all be paying taxes. In 1913, only the wealthiest Americans were required to pay income taxes. Yeah! During the years from 1939 to 1943, the individual income tax evolved from being a tax on just the rich into a tax on just about everyone. And here's why. In 1939, four million taxable returns produced $900 million of revenue for the government. To further fund the New Deal and World War II, they extended the tax to middle income earners. And by 1943, the number of taxable returns climbed to 41 million, and the government's revenue was boosted to 13 billion. And with the growth in revenue, there's been a growth in paperwork. By 2013, Americans were spending over 6 billion hours and more than $160 billion on tax preparation. Let me introduce you to Jeff Smijak. Jeff is an accountant who works for a variety of individuals and businesses, large and small, that pay a lot of taxes. So I, I work with privately held businesses. They are businesses that are smaller in size, normally owned by one or two individuals, and really are the foundation and the lifeblood of the U.S. economy. My successful clients often hear from other people that may not be in the same situation that they should be the ones that are paying more in taxes. What these people don't realize is these business owners are the ones that are taking the risk, the ones that are creating the jobs, and the ones that are facing the financial detriments uh, when times aren't so good. Since we're talking about taxes, how much did your clients pay last year? A lot of my clients, which are companies, pay taxes at a high rate. These rates can be in excess of 40%. If you have a business that generates $5 million in taxable income, that means over $2 million would have to be paid in tax on that. Can you imagine paying $2 million in taxes? That is money that can be used to further expand their business, to create jobs, to invest in equipment. Well, Jeff, some people would say that even with the taxes your clients paid, they're still rich. Some people would ask them to pay more. The top tax rate that people pay taxes on is 39.6%, which is an income tax rate. There's also additional taxes that they pay, such as self-employment tax, which can be anywhere from 2.9 to 7.65%. 
as well as state taxes that can vary anywhere up to nine, nine and a half percent. So when you add these taxes all together, you're looking at potentially paying taxes in excess of 50% of the income. 50%? Who'd want to go to work if you lose half of what you make to taxes? I've had conversations with several clients who pay a high tax rate. We've had discussions in regards to potentially moving their businesses offshore where the tax rates are much lower in other countries. I've also had clients make the decision that it just wasn't worth working for them anymore because of the amount that they were paying in taxes didn't justify the time they were spending. And if they decided to retire, what kind of impact would that have on our economy? If business owners make the decision to either retire or close up their business, it will have an impact on the amount of jobs available to those kids that are coming out of school looking for jobs. It will also impact the availability of goods and services that we have come to expect or assume that they would just be there. They won't be. Let's look at the facts. Who really pays taxes and what's really fair? Most people think that a person who is among the top 20% of all income earners is rich. But actually, the gross annual income of the top 20% of Americans starts at $136,113. That's the salary a video game designer or an airline pilot might get. But of course, they are taxed on that money and may only take home something close to $105,000. Wow, $30,000 straight to Uncle Sam. These people make about 49% of all post-tax income earned in the U.S. What percentage of the income taxes do you think they pay? 49%? As a matter of fact, according to the Tax Policy Center, they pay nearly 69% of all federal taxes coming in. Is that fair? If we're going to dig into the truth about who pays the most taxes, let me introduce you to another kind of expert. I've set up a chat with Jesse Hathaway. He's the managing editor of Budget and Tax News at the Heartland Institute. His investigative reports on taxes and public policy have appeared in local, state, and national publications. Jesse, these young people are doing a video project on taxes. They're trying to figure out who should pay taxes and how much is fair. Let me share a stat with you from the Tax Policy Center. 43% of households don't pay federal income tax. None at all? Yeah, how'd they get away with that? Some households don't earn enough. Others benefit from the many exemptions and credits that our tax code has. There are non-payers in high-income tax brackets. The Tax Policy Center estimates about 1% of non-payers earn six figures or more. And that means that 100% of the federal tax burden falls on 57% of all U.S. citizens. And that 57% don't pay taxes equally. The more you make, the higher your tax rate is. The tax here in the United States is a progressive tax, which taxes you more the more you earn. A person earning $37,000 is taxed at 15%. A person earning $189,000 is taxed at 33%. And a person earning $407,000 is taxed at nearly 40%. Most people think the wealthy should pay more taxes. Just as a cigarette tax makes people not want to smoke, Increasing the federal income tax could make people not want to work. Right. Here's another way of thinking about that. Suppose you went to work on Monday and 10% of your income was taxed. On Tuesday, 20% of your income was taxed. On Wednesday, 30%. On Thursday, 40%. And on Friday, 50% was taxed. Would you go back to work if you thought there was a chance the tax rate would continue to increase? Another way to make people unproductive is to reward them with someone else's tax money, such as welfare or subsidies. If I were a teacher and spread around test points so that everybody got good grades, there would be no incentive to study for tests. You got that right. I never crack open a book again. Oh right, because you'd be the first to pitch a fit if you got a C instead of an A. Most people believe the government needs to provide a social safety net. But at the same time, some people say the extent of the safety net is out of control. Few people agree on what the government ought to spend money on. So the question remains, what's fair? How much of your money is your government entitled to? Franklin Roosevelt wanted a 100% tax on everything individuals earned over $25,000 and couples earned over $50,000. So if you think a tax of 100% is just theft, at what level is it not theft? 90%? 70%? 50%?
If someone stole just half of your bicycle, would that still be theft? Well, 50% is not so far-fetched. Here's some info from the Tax Policy Center. For example, who pays what? First, we have to define the who. Who's rich and who's not? According to the Tax Policy Center, dividing up all the taxpayers according to what they pay, they found that the richest 10% of Americans, people with an income of $199,413 or more, paid not just 10% of the tax bill, but about 54% of all federal taxes. So if all those rich people stopped paying taxes, over 50% of the money the U.S. government gets from income taxes would simply disappear. Now let's look at those people who folks think are super rich. Those who are so successful that they're in the top 1% and make above $685,701 a year. These people earn about 13% of all post-tax income. Guess what percentage of the tax bill they pay? If you guessed 13%, you're way off. They pay a little more than 27% of the federal taxes. Higher tax rates could be construed as fines. It's like the government is saying to its citizens, it's wrong to make money. That's what my dad is always going on about. And then there are the unintended consequences. A while back, the government decided to lay a hefty luxury tax on the purchase of yachts. And guess what? Sales fell off and the companies that produced yachts were decimated. So who suffered? Not the billionaires, but thousands of middle-class yacht builders who lost their jobs. So what's fair? What percentage should people pay? Good question. In some countries, everyone except the poor pays a flat tax. For example, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, Estonia, a small but dynamic country on the Baltic Sea between Russia and Finland, found itself in an economic tailspin. Desperate for a new direction, Estonia elected the youngest prime minister in Europe's history. Mart Lahr was just 32 years old. What I read was Milton Friedman, the freedom of choice, and that was the only one. So. But there was a lot of good ideas therein, and I introduced a big part of those. We were the first country uh, introducing really this beautiful idea of the flat rate personal income tax. But it worked. Uh, it worked exactly in the way how it was prognosed by Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman was in favor of a flat tax for all Americans. But he feared we would never have it because it was the only tax that couldn't be manipulated or controlled by the Congress or special interests. So, are you ready to make your presentation in class? Yeah, we've got an amazing amount of information to pass on. Okay, let's take a look at your graphics. Most people have no idea what everyone else pays in taxes or what the federal government spends our tax money on. Special interest groups have swelled our tax code and its interpretive text to more than 74,000 pages. The richest 20% of people in America pay almost 70% of the taxes. And equally important, about 43% of U.S. households pay no federal income tax. The flat tax that works so spectacularly in Estonia could help us untangle our behemoth tax code, but probably won't because of the power and influence of special interest groups. I'd say the group did a great job summarizing what we've been talking about. Isn't this the kind of conversation we should be having with ourselves and with our government? It's worth considering, isn't it?